Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you and I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you have some community around you to be able to talk through some of these concepts and truths with. If you don't have community like that, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore. You can learn all about it on our website at restoreaustin.org. So click there and get all the information that you need. I hope that we see you soon at one of our gatherings, and I hope that you enjoy this message. Hey, everyone. We are so excited to have Latasha Morrison with us this morning on Summer Mixtape. Tasha, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, we've actually been talking about Latasha for a little while. She was on our recommended book list we put out last week, and um, uh, just incredible. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of her bio for those of you that don't know. Um, Latasha Morrison is a bridge builder, reconciler, and a compelling voice in the fight for racial justice. In 2016, she founded Be the Bridge, a nonprofit organization equipping more than a thousand subgroups across five countries to serve as ambassadors of racial reconciliation. Numerous organizations have recognized her as the leading social justice advocate, including Facebook's Community Leadership Program, Forbes, and Ebony Magazine. She is a native of North Carolina and she has earned uh, degrees in human development and business leadership. Her first book, Be the Bridge, was released in October of 2019 and quickly became a bestseller and winner of the Christianity Today Book Award. She is joining us this morning from Atlanta, where she currently lives, and we are so excited to have you on, Tasha. It's so good to be here. So good to be here. Uh, well, so that was your bio, but we'd love yeah. to, get a little, to know you just a little bit better. So what, can you give us just kind of the, the quick version of your story? Yeah, um, just for me, I, um, I started out, I'm originally from North Carolina, and I moved to Atlanta right after college. And so most of my adult life have, has been here in Atlanta. And then I moved um, for a job in Austin, Texas. So I was in, some of you may know me from Austin. I was there for about five and a half years, and I relocated back to Atlanta in 2017. So um, I'm back home um, where this, where the civil rights movement began, but this work of be the bridge actually started in Austin, Texas. And so um, Austin is very close to my heart. And I, I feel like if I have not, if I had not moved to Austin, I would not be doing this work. And so um, that's wow. where God met me and um, really continued to develop the seed in, 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 in my life. And um, I had a lot of support in the Austin community to do this work um, of racial bridge building. Oh, that's incredible, Tasha. Um, Austin is my uh, home too, born and raised here. Um, and okay. so it warms my heart to hear you say oh. uh, loving things about, about yeah. Austin. Um, yeah. That's so cool. Well, um, I, you, you wrote this incredible book, Be the Bridge, um, yeah. and obviously also founded this amazing organization. Um, last week when we uh, announced that you were going to be on, like I said, we put out the, the book list and recommended uh, as a starter, we put out six books, but recommended okay. as a starting place. Um, yeah. to go with Be the Bridge is kind of a first step. Um, right. And so as people are taking that first step and opening your book, um, mm -hmm. and, and someone who's read your book before, you yeah. actually start off part one. Um, it's called The Bridge to Lament. Now, yeah. lament is something that um, is an often kind of misunderstood term. And it can feel like, I think for a lot of us, an odd place to start the conversation, you know, right. around confronting racism, right? And so I, I would just love for you to take a few minutes and teach us why it is so vitally important to lament when we are on this journey. Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about lament, it means to express sorrow or regret. And when we think about our history, a lot of times, um, there's some barriers and obstacles because when we start doing this work together, um, there's some barriers where some people feel shame and guilt. Um, there's some barriers where it's just, it, our history is so, um, you know, it has so much atrocities connected to it that a lot of times we want to turn away from it. And so what, what lament causes us do, to do to really, because this work of reconciliation has to be girded with truth. 
And so we have to understand the full history. We have to understand, you know, we have to remove this revisionist history that we've um, that we've elevated and this romanticized view of slavery that we have have ingrained in us. We have to remove that and pull the layers back. You know, scripture tells us it's the truth that sets us free. And we this work has to be layered and done from um, this, this foundation of truth. And um and so that's important. And so when we, um, Henry Noren said that it's always, it's, it's, it's not always about saying the right thing or doing the right thing, but simply being present can mean the world to someone. Being present means listening to the hurt without correcting, presenting data to give hope or any other means to, um, that could um, help to recolonize someone's thinking in the midst of their grief. And I, and I think this is really important for us to learn to sit and to listen, to learn, and to lament. And that is hard for us to do because we want to do something. And sometimes when we're reacting out of our emotions, we do the wrong things or we say the wrong things. And so lament allows us to really get before God and to get close to those that are in the suffering. And um, a lot of this, when you start thinking about um, lamentations, highlights the suffering of Israel's divided kingdom. Um, you know, and in chapter two, it says, my eyes are worn out from weeping. My stomach is churning. My eye, my insides are poured on the ground because the daughter of my people is shattered because children and babies are fainting in the city of streets. And so if you think about that, you, and when we think about Nehemiah before he even made a move, like there was this great and deep sorrow that pushed him forward. Like lament helps prepare us for hope. And that's the thing that we have to remember is that it helps prepare us for hope. And so before he, before Nehemiah, um, you know, made a move, he, he prayed before he went to um, the king, but he was grieved for a city that he had never seen. You have to realize he was born in exile. And so he was weeping for something that he had never seen. And so, um, you know, lamenting sometimes horrific that has taken place allows this deep connection to form between the person lamenting and the harm that was done. And it's, it's, it's this emotional connection is the first step to creating a pathway for healing and hope. We have to sit in this sorrow and avoid trying to fix it right away. Avoid our attempts to make it all okay. Only then is the pain useful and only then can it lead us um, into healing and wisdom. And I think about this as it relates to, um, you know, a lot of us have heard about Rwanda and um, I've visited, visited there several times. Um, and one of the things that they do each year to, um, to, memorialize, um, they have this day of remembrance. So they don't run from their history. They face it front on. They don't want anyone to change the history. They don't want anyone to reshape the history or lie about the history. So they call it the genocide of the Tutsis. And so what happens that this is a, um, a genocide that took place um, for 100 days. And they commemorate these days um, each year to relieve pain, but to embrace healing and education to the generation on histor historical tragedies. They don't want lies perpetuated with the new generation because they do not want this atrocity to occur again. And if you build this foundation on lies, people don't know the truth. And so they can repeat history. And so they do that in April every year. They remember, they tell the stories, they honor, um, they mourn, they weep, they relieve themselves. And if we think about this, this is what 50% of the, the Psalms are about lamenting. Think about how David cried out for help with, from the Lord. Um, you know, and, and so some, so what the world should remember is how we, um, one of the things that in a Rwanda, what they want to remember is what the world should remember is how we abandoned human beings in, a, in one part of the world. We just have to, to make sure that it's established, we've established a criteria now that all humans count and not, not just the ones that meet our self-interest. And so that is their thing now. Like, we don't want this history repeated. We don't want a repeat of history where we stood by and let atrocities happen and to human beings, to those that are created in the likeness and image of God. And we sit back because we say they're not our own. 
sure. if we are the body of Christ and we are connected to one another, then if one part of the body suffers, then we all suffer with it. If one part of the body rejoices, we all rejoice in it. And so that's really um, important. So lament must be grounded in truth. And, um, you know, and this reconciliation process in Rwanda, um, it created unity and solidarity. They've come up with new language um, to celebrate this, 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 this newfound freedom, this newfound um, 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 movement that they have. And they call it Ubuntu, means greatness of heart. It means humanity, goodness, generosity, and kindness. Those who don't stand in complicity and face injustice. For those who is for those who risk their lives to rescue or to help those who are being persecuted. And so sometimes we can see that when it comes to other countries like Christians that are being persecuted, but we have to think about that and turn that mirror on ourselves and look and see. So in the midst of devastation, God is always showing signs of hope. We Christians need to learn to look, even in the midst of devastation, the signs and seeds of hope that God is planting. And this, that statement is said, um, um, said by a theologian called um, Kakananga. And so um, I just love that, you know, when we talk about um, in the midst of des devastation, when we can't see any hope, um, God is there. And I see that happening right now as we look at our country. Um, it's painful. It's ugly to have to face this, this the, the generational trauma yeah. that our unrepentance has, has caused. But on the other side of this, if we face this and we face it the right way, there's beauty on the other side of that. Yeah. Oh, Tasha, that's so good. Can, yeah. can I ask you, how do you feel like um, I mean, incredible story with Rwanda, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if yes. you, we, we know what, what happened there, most of us, and, and to hear that um, and the intentionality behind it, I'll be honest, it, it feels radically different than anything I've ever experienced in right. the West or in America. And um, so, and, and, and we, you know, maybe it wasn't the, the same intensity for a hundred days, right? But it's broken out over 400 years. Right, um, right. And it, it's, it's a lot, right? And so I guess I would ask you this, how do you feel like we have done in America um, at agreeing upon the truth of what has happened and collectively lamenting it? We haven't done that in America. When we think about um, our history, uh, we've never had a collective repentance. And we're the country that really says that its foundation is in Christian principles. Right. And, but we have to ask, where's, where is the fruit of that? Um, you know, when we look at Canada, Canada, I talk about this in the book, Canada has a truth and justice um, um, committee. Um, you think about New Zealand, um, um, Australia, they all have this, this conversation that's a part of policy, that's a part of their government where they're looking at their past and see how do we right this wrong? And if anyone should know how to do that as it relates to the Ministry of Reconciliation, Christians should do that. And the country that says that it's founded on Christian principles should have been the first in line. It should not have taken 400 years. And we still haven't had a, a formal confession or apology. We're unrepentant. Now, we can't control government structures, but we can control ourselves. We can control our personal lives. We are a part of a church. We're a part of a, uh, I mean, the uh, we are part of a remnant that represents Christ. And so if we begin to change individually, then the, the, the intersections and the structures that we interface with will begin to change. And so when we start saying, you know what, I know I didn't break this. I didn't cause it. None of us caused it. You know, you weren't a slave owner and I wasn't a slave. But the impact of that is not about intent, but the impact of that has been generational. And because we are connected and we are the body of Christ and we understand that the Bible is about a collective, it's not about individualism, you know, it's about a collective. When one part of the tribe sin, what happened? All the other parts were, had to suffer the consequences. And we understand that as it relates to our biblical history. We understand what it means about remembrance. There's so many things as, as it relates to baptism 
um, as it relates to communion, all these things that we do in remembrance of who. So we understand that. We understand that. We see, you know, all the festivals, the Jewish festivals that take place and, um, you know, all these things, Hanukkah, all these different things. And so we have to understand those same spiritual disciplines, those same practice practices. Not only do we practice those as individuals, but we practice that as a collective. And so we should know how to do confession and repentance well, because it is a part of our faith and theology. And so we have to walk that out as it relates to our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy. Praxy. And so um, it's not just about what we say, but it's also about what we do. And we see that in Isaiah 117. It wasn't about the religious festivities that was happening, um, but it was because the lack of justice and righteousness that were shown in the day-to-day -day lives of not doing the work of justice, not seeking justice. And so we have to make sure that we're doing that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Tasha. That's so good. And I, I think about um, the Old Testament ending right with Malachi and, and God's word yeah. to the people through Malachi. I wish you would yes. just shut the temple doors because yes. you don't care, right? And it, your exactly. sacrifices mean nothing yes. when you aren't practicing my heart and justice for the, yeah. your nation and the nations around you. So yeah. that's really well put. I, I wonder, um, this may seem like an odd question, but if uh -huh. you were in charge, right? And and we we were gonna, you know, you'd been put on a committee of like truth and justice, like say Canada right. or New Zealand or something like that has, and you were leading it up here in America. What, mm -hmm. what, what would, what some of the things that you would do? What are some steps that you would kind of take to help us take that step of lament as a nation, but also just even as a, as a church, as a body of Christ, the remnant that you talked about? Yeah, if I was in charge of something like that, you know, we have historical documents, um, you know, like I said, we didn't break it, but it is our responsibility as a collective to, to be a part of the solution. And, and so I think one of the things that I would do is make sure because this is the key. When I look at Germany and what they've done with the Holocaust, and I look at Rwanda and what they've done, and when I look at Canada and how they have researched and they know what they did to their native tribes, their First Nations, they know that they you know, took babies away from families um, and sold them so that they can be stripped of their culture. And we did the same thing here in the United States. So you have to make sure that you confess those things that were wrong you have to repent of those things. You know, so one of the first things that I would do is to make sure that our history is inclusive yeah. and that we are teaching full history like they do in, his, in um, Germany. Germany, you can't homeschool there because they do not want the ideology of Nazism repeated. So when your child turns five and they enter into school, the history that they learn is telling the full truth of how we messed up. Mm. Wow. And this is how it happened. Yeah. These are the yeah. mistakes we made. And this is why it's wrong. Ooh. And so wow. from a public standpoint, from a country, they're putting forth the truth. They're not hiding it. They're not saying, well, um, this, we, we lift up people who were, that committed genocide against natives. I mean, entire native tribes were executed under the hand of Columbus, you know, and we lift up, we celebrate days like that. And so some of people are probably hearing this and like, you can look it up. Google is your friend. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, there's so many scholarly documents on this fact that I'm saying, but when you think about how we have tried to change history, and it doesn't mean that someone was all bad, but it also means that they weren't all good. And we need to tell the full truth of the story. And I think that's where I would start. I would start with our education system and making sure that there is diversity in thought and inclusivity in those who write um, um, school books and textbooks. And there is a, a, a proposed plan that would be inclusive to teach from fifth grade all the way up to, um, to high school. And there would also be a requirement that any homeschool or private school education would also have to have that, that taught. Because I think teach, starting with truth, the foundation of truth would really change that because then we would have not just, um, we want to have a common language, but we also will have a common memory. And right now we don't have that common memory. We all 
are remembering history differently, which causes a barrier. Yes, and gosh, I, I love that. I love how practical that is. I, I Just hearing it, I feel like it yeah. could make such a huge difference because I mean, I knew yeah. as someone who, who grew up in here in Austin and you know went to public schools and private schools through uh, fourth grade public schools after that, um, you know, I, I had a very whitewashed understanding of history, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I, they were like, they were like two paragraphs about slavery. Yeah. And, yeah. and at least one of them was like, hey, it wasn't that bad, you know, and a lot of slaves yeah. were treated like family. And, and, and then you, I mean, you and think and about you... that statement. And that's that was was said to me in Texas, like, think about that statement. No, you don't treat your family. Uh, if you have a if that's how you love your family, then that's wrong. Because when people don't have choice, they don't have free will, they are denied education, they are treated like animals, they are considered chattel. Like we have this romanticized view of that. And it was all about economics. And it right. didn't just last for decades, it lasts for centuries. And so there is no, there is no words to say that, okay, they, people were enslaved, but they were happy. Like, Right, right. in the world like they were oppressed and you know people they could not mourn they could not show emotions so we really have to start reading even slave narratives I, I think you know a good book that for me um that really got in, in depth with this for me was stamped from the beginning um yeah, that so was a, a really good one and then the other thing is for people to see 12 years of slave if you have not yeah. seen that movie I don't care if you don't like movies like that, make yourself look at that because yep. it would really erase the part where you feel like um, that people were happy and things were better and that it was okay. Um, and, and think about if this role was reversed and this was happening to, um, you know, Europeans um, which a lot of people will say, well, all groups were enslaved at some point, but not generational slavery right. based on race. And we have to understand that race is a social and co political construct. And I don't have time to go into all those details, but this is what we do with our organization, Be The Bridge. We break all of these things down. Um, and I do some of this in the book, but we do this in our trainings for people to help point them in a direction to give them that first, second, third step to have them to improve their racial literacy and understand the brokenness so that they, we can begin to heal and move forward where not just some are flourishing, yeah. but all are able to flourish. So yeah. that's and, and I so agree with you, Tasha, that that has to be um, informed by uh, our faith, right? And, and yes. if our faith is not compelling us into action for justice and equality and inclusion for all people, then I, it seems like what James called a, a dead faith, right? A non-practicing. Yes. Faith. Yes. yes. Um, so I, I love how I love how faith-centered all your stuff is. Um, I mean, be, be the bridge uh, book is is phenomenal. I already told people to to pick it up. Um, and uh, and we were just talking before we started that. Um, it, it, it's out right now in a lot of places. Yeah. And so you got to get <laughs> Audible or you got to get Kindle, or, right? Yeah. <laughs> I had Amazing. someone just texting me right before I got on this, um, this Zoom and they said, um, I know your book is sold out everywhere. Do you have any copies? This is like the fourth call that I've had of wow. friends because they're recommending the book. Um, I, you know, we, we got rid of our last um, stack when we were in Boston doing a training okay. there. Um, and so I think I may have like a few copies left. And wow. so, but I, if you go to Barnes and Noble, it's Barnes and Noble is open in your area. Barnes and Noble does carry it. And then okay, some cool. other smaller local bookstores, you can go there and request it. But, you know, with COVID and all of that, they're trying, but any book, this is a good thing. This is something for us to celebrate. And I think this is a God moment where the top 100 books in this country right now are all about race, it's you incredible. know? Yeah. And so all about race, um, racial justice, racial reconciliation. And if anybody should be leading this work, the family of God, listen, we Amen. have got to be the headlights in this and yeah. not the taillights. We have, we have been on the wrong side. The church has been on the wrong side of history throughout this. You know, we have formed denominations because we didn't gr agree about slavery. You know what I'm saying? We, we were on the wrong side of segregation 
It wasn't that the church was standing on the sidelines saying, hey, we cannot do this to God's image bearers. We were participants, active participants. We weren't just complicit. We helped create the infrastructure. Exactly. So we have to lament that. We have we're to repent that. of that because we are collective. So if you're part of the body of Christ, we are family. And so it's important that we repent even as individuals for our collective good. And so that's, the, that's what we're saying as it relates to push us toward reconciliation and what that means. And reconciliation and, and justice means to make it right. How do we make it right? How do we repair this now? How do we set up systems where some are not crushed under that system, right. but all are made to flourish? And we have to understand we have injustices in our systems that we see now playing out because what we have done is we have outlawed certain things. We've created amendments, yeah. but we didn't go back and undo the mess that yeah. we've made. And so That's we true. created another system on top of a bad system. I want to give you this right here just, just because I like Zach and I want to give this to you for free. <laughs> okay. But the thing that we need to repent and lament of you know, when it comes to redlining, you can read about this more in the book called The um, the Color of Law. But we, because of segregation, we segregated ourselves environmentally and, and, and also geographically. And so this was set up by our government where those, if this was a black area, the houses were, were um, devalued. So my grandparents lived in a neighborhood because it was a black designated neighborhood. So they bought a house in the neighborhood that they could only buy a house in. And so it was devalued value as it relates to loans and loans that you can get. And so um, when we outlaw that system with the, um, with the Fair Housing Act, when we outlaw that system, we didn't go back and say, well, let's reevaluate these homes because they're just like the homes, you know, across the, the, the railroad tracks. Um, let's reevaluate these homes and give the people what is due to them. Let's make this right. We didn't do that. We outlawed it. And then we said, well, let's build a school system on top of this broken system. And the school systems will get a percentage of their, um, their taxes to go into those schools. So therefore, we created an unjust education system that was based off of property taxes of land that was already devalued. That's just one example. And we have 1,000 and one more that we can go over about that. But I just wanted to give you that, that example just like that um, so that you be can begin to do some work on the things that we need to lament. Ah, that's good, Tasha. Uh, thank you for that really practical example. I was in Atlanta a couple of years ago at a conference and we had a little like four or five hour break and I went down to uh, the Dr. King Center and walked oh, yeah. around and you know saw the childhood home and all that stuff. And as the guy took us through the tour on the home, he explained a lot of that for the first time yeah. about that neighborhood specifically. Yes. And um, I mean, I was weeping as he talked about it. I mean, it was, it was just, it was stuff that, that if we don't pause and agree upon the truth of this and then lament, I, okay. I, I don't know how we can move forward after that. Right. right? It has right. to start there. Right. It has uh, to start there. And that's a good place because it, it humbles us yeah. and it allows God to speak to us not our systems, not our politics, not our partisanship, but it allows God that has always sided with the marginalized in scripture yeah. Yeah. to speak to our hearts. This is not about a blue or red, but this is like a third place. You know, we, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. So the systems of this world is broken. And the kingdom of God requires a new system, a new thought, a new process, a new way. And so we have to remember that, that we are ambassadors of Christ. Yes. And we have let things, we have ingested some things that are not of God, that do not glorify God, that lift up people, it lifts up, it lifts up country over God. And we have got to repent of that and lament that. Where have we, examine your life and see where you have let that in. Yes. And look at how are we treating our neighbor? Yes. And our neighbors 
don't look like us. And so our neighbors are those that are in um, Iraq. Our neighbors are also those that are in Afghanistan. Our neighbors are those that are in South Korea, North Korea, China, you know, Ireland, you know, England. Those are also our neighbors. Mexico. That's right. You know, there's not different heavens. <laughs> <laughs> for different groups of people. Then, you know, it's not like the, the Latina is going to be on the West side, you know, <laughs> and, and we, we have to remember that Jesus did not speak English. That's right. That's right. So we have to understand that any supremacy outside of God's supremacy yeah. is idolatry. Yeah. And we good. have to repent. Oh, of that. And oh, so really we good. have to make sure that we are honoring God and how we treat each other. And yeah. that's very important, even the people that we don't like. And I have to think about that. We have to, just as much as I cry out for justice, I have to yeah. cry out for God's redemption. That's right. And that's, that's the work we, sh we should be about. So, you know. So, yeah. Oh, that's good, Tasha. Thank you. And, and you know, I want to say, too, for, for my white sisters and brothers watching this, um, that, that it really does start with what we've been talking about for a few weeks here at Restore uh, of listening and learning yes. um, from people of color specifically and from the black community right now specifically. Um, and you do so much teaching in the book, Be the Bridge, and also in the groups. And so I I'd love to end with you just kind of, could you give us an overview of kind of what happens in the groups and, and why it's so powerful? Yeah, with um, Be the Bridge, one of the things I wanted to start out is because I was having these conversations a little bit, um, just in personal conversations with people, and I would notice that we didn't have a, a common memory and we didn't have um, a common language. And, and so I noticed that a lot of people live in isolated bubbles, racial isolated bubbles. And so uh, when, we enter, we, when we become proxim proximate to people, that's just the beginning because proximity, you can be in proximity to people and not change. That's right. Because That's right. you're not listening and you're not learning and you're not lamenting. Yeah. And so I think it's important for us to be in proximity to people, but also we have to educate ourselves. We have to buy the books. We have to look at the movies and that's God to show you your blind spots. And so that's what we do and be the bridge. So we have an online community um, that you have to answer questions because we want people who are serious about this work, um, people who are not just observers in this work, but people who are willing to do the work. And so you have to sit silent in our group, online group for three months. And we have units that people go through um, to begin helping them understand a lot of this. And then uh, we have offline groups. And if you go to be the bridge.com, you can see there's, um, you know, there's um, a discussion guide that we download and we tell you to get with a diverse group of people, um, but making sure that the leadership of that is a person of color. And so if you're in an environment where there's not a lot of um, people of color, um, there's another um, tool that we have you start with and it's called BTB 101. And we're doing some intro um, online webinars to that, but there's um, groups of people can form this BTB 101 um, course. And so we have so many tools and we're putting that, we put out two new ones this year. We put out one for transracial adoptive families, and then we put out another one for youth. Um, so we have a module one for youth and we'll be rolling out this summer another module for youth um, a got a people of color discussion and we're, we are re revamping our original be the bridge guide um, by the end of the year there'll be a new one for that so we have all these tools there's discussion cards on our website where you can um, you know do that with a group of people um, also, so there's a lot of tools. We want to give people the resources to help them have this conversation, to help them lean into um, this conversation on 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 just uh, on racial justice that can move us toward racial healing and reconciliation. Um, and so we try to fill in the gaps where we know that there's information lacking. We try to fill in those gaps with that. And so we start. A lot of times, groups start online, you know, and people form groups out. There's a pretty large community in Austin, Texas, um, your church can partner with another church to do this, you know, um, but we want people talking to one another. We want people building community with one another and not just to check a box, but to, this is a lifestyle that we're committing to. This is a lifestyle that we want to embrace. And, um, th that's the most important thing that, um, that we commit to this. This is a part of our, um, you know, discipleship. This is discipleship.
That's exactly so. right. Thank you, Tasha. Um, I will link all of that stuff in our okay. uh, in the comment section and on our website and everything, so that everybody can get that info and jump in if they if they can and they want to. Um, and we would encourage all of y'all to do that if you're watching right now. Um, yeah. Tasha, thank you for being on. Um, I, I want to ask one more thing of you before yep. we finish. And okay. that, that's just if you would just pray for us yes, um, before well. we go. If you would just pray for, for our world, um, for, for justice, um, for yeah. us to take these steps of, of lament and agreed upon truth as faith communities and, and all of that stuff. We'd love for you to just pray over us in that way. Yeah. Father, we, we thank you, Father, that you are, you see us and that you know us and that you're with us and that you are for us, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for Zach, Lord, that he is leading with courage, Lord. So many pastors would dare to touch this subject, but I thank you, Father, that he is a part of the remnant, Lord God, that is doing justice and wants to do the work of righteousness in this land, Lord God. So I pray, Father, that we as a body would continue um, to be a light, Lord, that how we love one another, the love that we show for one another would reflect back to the Father. So I pray, Father, that you would help the church be that, Lord, that you would help us to remove the blind spots, Lord God, to up to uproot the ideologies that are unhealthy, Lord God, the idols that we have built of things that are um, not of you, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you would begin to tear those things down in our heart right now, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would speak um, to the hearts of your people and to show them your way of justice and righteousness. I thank you, Father, for bringing all of this to light now, Lord God. So we ask that you would be the healing balm that takes place of not just across our country, Lord, but across this, this global world because we're all connected. We are all your children. And so I pray, Father, that we would, would begin to see each other in those light, that light, Lord. So we thank you and we love you. And may you receive the glory from our life. In Jesus' name, amen.